Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar by the Society of Publishers in Asia. It's called How to Embrace Social Media Revolution uh, Without Getting Burned. And my name is Tom Leander. I'm the editor uh, for Asia for Lloyd's List, a maritime publication. Um, and it's global. And uh, I'm also the uh, SOPA editorial chairman committee. And now, we have with us, um, from land and sea, a truly remarkable lineup of, of uh, experts with different takes on social media and its impact on media organizations. In no particular order, let me tell you who they are. Um, we have Liz Herron, who's a director of social media um, and engagement at the Wall Street Journal. Digital Network, um, Liz leads the uh, team of journalists who tap into social media for news gathering and real-time news coverage, creative distribution, community engagement. And she also develops strategies for uh, innovating uh, in emerging areas such as social media and mobile technology, uh, among others. Um, uh, Liz was also a social uh, media editor at the New York Times before going over to the journal and digital editor for the foreign and national security uh, at the uh, Washington Post. And we're very pleased to have her. We also have uh, Yolanda Ma, who is uh, Assistant Project Manager Data, Thomson Reuters. Uh, you know, Yolanda is an uh, award-winning digital strategist and, and currently working at uh, Reuters at Data Journalism. Before that, she was the first ever social media editor at the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, and um, where she led Hong Kong's uh, first crowdsourced interactive map and oversaw the paper's social media development and community engagement. Now also, um, coming in um, rather late in the lineup, but we're very, very pleased to have her. We have uh, Becky uh, Hepton Stahl, who is, uh, she's from the uh, Financial Times. She's, Rebecca's responsible for commercial and brand-led aspects of the Financial Times social media strategy. Um, and prior to joining the FT, Rebecca worked uh, agency side in both social media and integrated agencies, handling campaign execution and community, community management for a range of clients um, uh, through travel to media. And um, we also have uh, a, a bit of a local hero, but also known around the world, Jay Oatway. Um, he's a speaker, author, and social business consultant. Um, he's a former tech journalist who has become a regional leader in social media, reach, and influence. And he's the author of a book, Mastering Story, Community Influence uh, to Become a Social Leader. Now, Jay has more than 100,000 followers worldwide and was dubbed Hong Kong's answer to Twitter royalty by Marketing Magazine. And last but not least, we have Thomas Crampton, who is the uh, Asia-Pacific Director of Social Media at Ogilvy & Mather. Um, he founded, uh, Tom founded the largest and most awarded social media team in the region at Ogilvy. Um, Tom, um, as many of you probably know, is a former correspondent for the New York Times and the IHT, International Herald Tribune. And he was based out of, chronologically, uh, Paris, Bangkok, uh, Hong Kong, New York, Washington, and Paris. And he moved to Beijing and Hong Kong to do business development for a major media company. And he's currently based here in Hong Kong. Now, I'm going to give uh, Tom the, uh, the floor, but first, uh, um, to line up and give us a series of slides on um, uh, the challenge the social media is uh, delivering to, to traditional media companies. Um, but I wanted to say a word or two as a scene setter. Um, you know, I was thinking about this. I was, I was reminded that anyone who's worked themselves through uh, Marcel Proust remembers of things past. It will recall a wonderful essay on how the telephone changed relationships at the time the book was written, which was around the First World War. And um, anyone who is, uh, sorry, um, it, it, that's ancient history now, um, uh, that social media will someday be. Um, but the change was very radical. Uh, the mere fact um, of being able to connect with anybody over distance disrupted and um, uh, redefined personal relations and gave a new tool to business and gave people who understood the implications of what this new communicability offered a distinct advantage. Now, uh, social media is doing something, something similar to business and particularly media business as we speak. Uh, media companies used to own the news. That's no longer true. Uh, they compete or find common ground with different constituencies that have moved into their turf. Social media has also enhanced the power of media companies to reach and broaden audiences and to gain new exposure, to build community, and to get feedback. Media companies now have to compete with what you might call the democratization of news and against entities uh, from Fortune 500 companies to a person on the scene with a cell phone. Now, in the process, relationships are changing between media companies and their audience and between workers within media companies. Among journalists, for example, there are opportunities for those that can embrace social media as reporting 
an audience building tool and those that are somewhat adrift in the social media ocean. And publishers, too, face a similar divide and also an opportunity that comes once in a lifetime to get ahead of the pack, to make something new and original, to redefine the companies they're in. So we're here with a rallying cry for understanding and insights into how this wonder is changing our lives. And no better person to introduce you to the challenges of social media is throwing down to traditional media than Tom Crampton, that distinguished journalist I mentioned, global citizen, and now social media evangelist for Ogilvy. Um, but um, just a moment, before Tom takes it away, I was meant to do a bit of housekeeping. And um, I wanted to uh, encourage everyone, uh, on-demand viewing uh, archive file will be available and e with email notifications afterwards. And um, I would say that uh, speakers joining us, uh, click on the arrow to expand uh, on their bio. And um, please uh, help to share SOPA webinars with others and sign up um, with only an email address and country input at www.sopasia.com. Pardon me for forgetting that, and now I would like to uh, give Tom the floor. Thank you. Tom Crampton. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be uh, speak with everyone. We've got a great uh, lineup of people on the attendee list that I can see from many different publications and uh, uh, sectors. Um, we, of course, welcome the, 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 the Twitter comments, and uh, Tom, I guess, will be highlighting those when they come through. Um, yes. What I was asked to do is give just a quick overview of a take on this, uh, you know, where social media is and the impact on media. As Tom said, the, the perspective I take on that is that I now work in social media, but was formerly a journalist. Um, so I'd like to quickly just go through looking at the scale of what's happening in social media in Asia. Uh, in, this is a, uh, uh, just a quick look at, at the impact of Facebook where you have, uh, and these numbers, by the way, are a little bit out of date. Uh, it's growing fast. Uh, 45 million Facebook users in India, 42 million in Indonesia. The purpose of this is think about that in terms of a publication and the reach of that. This slide is looking at a little bit in terms of the penetration in given markets. Uh, interestingly, if you look in the top right, uh, Indonesia is 130% penetration of the online population on Facebook. Uh, why is it so high? That's because Facebook updates its statistics much faster than governments update their uh, numbers on the penetration of the Internet. On the bottom left graph, which is a little bit misconfigured here by the webinar platform, uh, is looking at the national population of these countries that are on Facebook. That means if you're counting every man, woman, and child in Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, they all outstrip the United States in terms of the number of people on Facebook, which is one social media platform, not always the most popular one in many markets. And just looking quickly at that, these are uh, social media bullseyes that, that, that we've done uh, here at Ogilvy. By the way, if, any, if anybody's interested in these slides, just shoot me an email at thomas.crampton at ogilvy.com, and I'm happy to share them. Um, but this is just looking on the outside ring, you can see the global platforms. On the inside ring, you can see the local, locally popular platforms. And it varies country by country in Asia how popular these various platforms are. Uh, in the case of Japan, there's a fair bit of difference. If you look at Korea, again, there's a, there, there, you know, in the top right, uh, at, at sort of 1 o'clock, you have under social networks, Facebook being the globally most well-known one. You have SciWorld, Naver, uh, and of course the, the rise of the mobile apps such as WeChat, which is very important. Vietnam has similar issues to China in that there's a lot of government involvement uh, in social media and the impact on it um, where you have uh, blockages, uh, and that's partly the, 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 the reason that Zing.vn has succeeded against Facebook. It's an interesting example of SciWorld being a social network out of uh, Korea, out of Asia, somewhere else in Asia that has, has thrived. And finally, uh, uh, we have China, which is, of course, the, the mother of all differences in social media. There is almost no overlap between the inner circle, which is the platforms popular in China, uh, and the outer circle, which is the platforms popular globally. Um, and then you have new categories that have arisen. If you look in the, at one, between 1 and 2 o'clock with SNS and microblogging, something like Sina Weibo, which formerly started as a Twitter clone, 
is now a hybrid between Facebook and Twitter as it's evolved in its unique way. The final point I'd like to make just in terms of the reach and variety of platforms here is uh, uh, if you look at Taiwan, it turns out that one of the most popular social media platforms is not one of these great brand names either globally or locally, but to get to a place where a lot of conversations are taking place online right now, you shut down your browser, you start up uh, something called Terminal if you're using a Windows computer, and log on to something called Telnet. Telnet is not Web 2.0, it's, it's hardly even Web 1.0. It's sort of a BBS system that half a million people in Taiwan are on every day. So that's just to say really what you want to look is to where conversations are taking place and where people are gathering, not necessarily the latest company to IPO. So all of that is really about the reach uh, and, and penetration of social media and the way in which it's now set itself up to really be something that the news media was in the past. And if you look at it from the point of view where I sit right now, uh, working with a lot of companies that are trying to understand the world and what their consumers are doing, if in the past they were told in the 20th century, don't subscribe to a newspaper, we don't want to know about anything that's written in the newspapers, that would be the equivalent today to a company saying that they didn't want to know what was happening in social media or they're not paying attention in social media. From the point of view of a company, not being involved in social media, I used to say, was a lost opportunity. I would now say it's actually a business risk. You're going to be out of touch with your customers. Now, looked at from the perspective of uh, uh, media, I would say that social media has actually become a competitor and sometimes an actual direct competitor. What we have up here on the face of it is two different publications, uh, both on the similar topic, fashion. In fact, they operate under radically different business models. On the right, the fashion magazine operates through subscription uh, and advertising, a traditional media model, whereas on the left, this is actually a magazine uh, produced by, uh, on, uh, it's on, online, this is the online version that I accessed here, produced by Netta Porte. It has a lot of content, it has a lot of articles, they're making a huge push into the production of content, uh, and they're hiring journalists. Their product is a lost leader. They don't have to make money on that from advertising, they make money from that on sales. This is a radically different business model and a radically different approach which businesses now have to looking at content uh, in contrast to the way that traditional media companies look at content. One fundamental way, of course, is that businesses want to turn their social media presence into uh, uh, money directly. Uh, that's something that uh, uh, focuses their efforts and, and makes them behave in a different kind of a way. Uh, in terms of rolling out and meet, reaching new audiences, they want to do that in a very radical way and they're doing anything they can to do it. Why am I showing this picture? This, on the face of it, is an image of Aqua Scutum, which is a brand, uh, British brand well-known for fashion. In fact, if you look very closely, it's a photo I took in, in Shenzhen uh, a few weeks ago. It's actually Aqua Squenton. It's a rip-off of Aqua Scutum, uh, a, fake, uh, a fake shop, basically. So if you're Aqua Scutum, you're going to be trying to push your, your brand out as much as you can all across China, trying to find ways that you can build yourself before Aquasquentin has a chance to build up a significant market share. Uh, as a business, you're not only going to be searching for new, new audiences, but you're also going to be looking in a very uh, uh, rational and measured way how you are performing. This is a, a study of the usage of social media in relation to uh, the food and beverage industry. Uh, what you've got on the right is the bubbles according to size of when people are looking at uh, uh, and, and engaging online with food and beverage uh, related brands. Uh, on the left, uh, the black line shows that same, that, that same chart. The red line shows, however, when companies tend to be posting things online on their uh, uh, Facebook pages or social media presences. And the big red line you see is on Friday, which, if you look on the right, is a very small bubble. That means that a lot of brands are putting things online, but on Friday very few people are actually acting or, or, or doing things online. 
Uh, this means that you're, they're losing huge audiences, but it's this kind of thing that they're studying to make sure that they're publishing things at the right moment and the right time. One of the amazing things that we can do now with social media in terms of engagement and measurement is we can actually measure how often people are uh, uh, reacting to things. Uh, it turns out that we can measure what makes them uh, uh, engage more, and if you ask a question, you have 15% higher engagement rate, but it's also important to know what question you ask. If you ask why, you're much less likely to get a response than if you ask where, when, uh, and would, you know, in de decreasing order of significance. This means that you really need to figure out what are the ways that you're going to uh, uh, end up having the engagement. I think why is this an existential question, perhaps. I'm not sure exactly the reason behind this, but where is something where I'm helping somebody out. Um, finally, uh, if you're looking at it from the point of view of how brands are, are getting involved in social media and this sort of dynamic of almost setting themselves up in competition with traditional media, uh, this is the sort of take that a company might have when they're trying to understand how they are going to uh, react to what's happening online. They're going to collect the information, analyze it, strategize what to do with that information, and then figure out how they're going to respond across a range of platforms, which, if you look at it, is really the same configuration of a newsroom where you have reporters, uh, you have editors, you have your editorial meeting, uh, you get those reporters out there writing the stories, and then they're being sent out onto the platform. So in that sense, even the way that these brands operate, you've got a company that was never formally involved in publishing or getting out information that now has this newsroom-like uh, workflow to it uh, that is important to the way that they're, that they're doing things. So Tom, I'd like to, to hand it back to you, but I'd love to get any questions, reactions, comments, uh, uh, very much welcome that. I don't know if there's been anything coming over Twitter or if we move on to our next panelist. Ah, uh, we, we can move on to the next panelist. Uh, nothing at the moment. I'm fascinated by Aquas Quentin. That's very, very clever. Thank you for, uh, for that, Tom. Um, I'd like to get back to you in a minute about the Asia um, side of this, but I wanted to uh, turn to Jay, Jay Oatway, and, and ask him uh, what advice he has uh, when he talks to publishers and editors regarding uh, building and strengthening a, a social media program, given the kind of challenges and business risks that uh, Tom was talking about. Jay? Oh, <clears throat> thanks, Tom. Um, I think the first thing we have to do as people who have come from the era of mass media is to stop thinking in terms of audience. And I, th I know it's really hard. Uh, we've been trained for ages to be sort of in our ivory towers speaking down to these people. But we live in a social age now where these aren't – this isn't an audience that we're pushing news to. This is a community, a community that we're sharing news with. And it really changes the way that we have to think about our business model as well, that we're, not, we're no longer selling access to content, although I know many of you out there with paywalls are actually selling access to content. But what we really should be trying to think about is how we're selling access to this community. What sort of things we're doing that binds this community together. When we talk about like, the words like engagement, like when people are, are clicking on things, or Tom said, oh, if we put a word in here, a question in here, they'll get 15% better like, click through a response. I mean, what is our, what's our conversion here going to be? What are we trying to get these people to do? Uh, and what we really want to do is we want to, get the, we want to strengthen the community. We want to strengthen the, the social capital between everybody within our community. And, and if we do this right, and if we, do, if we create a community that is within sort of our walled gardens uh, of, of, of instead of a paywall, thinking of it as a, as a community wall, uh, protecting our community, allowing them to, to share information amongst each other, then I think we're creating a much, a much stronger uh, platform for publishing. And, uh, and because it's not one that we're, we're having to sell news. What we're trying to do is, is talk to to advertisers to say, would you like to buy access to our community? Would you like to join the conversation? And not just in a way by shouting at people, but actually being able to go in, to ask questions, to listen, to find out what's going on, to do all these social things. I think it's an important shift in a way we think. And it's not just like, oh, we need to put some more like buttons on something. It's, it's a much, much deeper uh, fundamental strategy. Right. Um, I, given the kind of change you're talking about, about uh, the audience no longer 
um, being the thing that we have to look for. We have to look for a community. Um, Becky, I wanted to ask you um, whether that's um, the thinking uh, in your approach at the FT, um, whether uh, this kind of change is actually being accepted and understood. Definitely. And we really believe in the importance of um, building communities with our loyal band of readers. Um, they expect to be listened to, which is why we make great use of the comments section on FT.com. And a lot of our journalists actually get involved in the conversation there, answer questions, um, and pose further questions to really spark debate. Um, I sit on the commercial side of the business at the FT, so my role is really focused around engaging staff on all things digital generally. And we also have a communities editor, and she's a journalist in the newsroom, and she focuses on training journalists formally and informally on social media. And that can be um, anything from making sources uh, through to creating content and building their own communities. A lot of our journalists have got huge followings on social media, and so we really encourage them to make the most of those because they're, they're really the people that drive the conversation. Thank you. Um, could I turn to, to Liz uh, in New York and, and ask a, a similar question about embracing um, social media at the WSJ? I mean, do you, is there a mindset change um, that you have seen or are introducing uh, into the organization in the newsroom there? Absolutely. Audience um, versus community. Audience versus community, yeah. You know, we definitely, I think there's a real understanding in the newsroom now um, how much value there is in conversing with our readers and our community and in, in you know reaching out to people who may not be WSJ readers right now, but but would be if they knew they could find something great on the WSJ. Um, and you know, same with FT, we have really big followings amongst our journalists, and we also use the main social media accounts often to pose questions about where the newsy topic of the day is, and um, you know, also ask people to send in photos. We try to really, you know, Jay said something about um, how. You know, you want to join in the conversation and not sort of just see these people as your audience. And in the same spirit, we try to really capture behavior that's already happening and join in. So when I talk about having people send in photos, instead of asking them to email us stuff, you know, we'll just say, you, we know you're already posting pictures of, of the Festival of Holy on Twitter and Instagram, so just add a hashtag that we can see and we'll put them on our website. Um, so we really try to take advantage of things that are already happening and you know, get people excited about talking to the WSJ. Yeah, interesting. Um, Thomas, uh, I, I turn back to you. Actually, I was fascinated by your uh, individual slides of um, uh, different Asian markets, and I mean, they, what is quite distinctive about them? Um, how do you approach when you're talking to publishers and editors, or if you do, um, what would you say to them um, regarding um, basically embracing social media uh, in this region in particular, um, given various platforms? If you're talking about in terms of the platforms, you just have to find the most relevant platforms and uh, what is the, the, the you know, relevant one not only for your market but also for what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, and you want to understand whether that's going to be a microblogging platform that tends to be something that is more of a, a broadcast style or is it more of a community-based platform uh, like a Zing in, in Vietnam or a Facebook style. Um, so it's sort of f figuring out where the the uh, uh, conversations are taking place so you can actually get involved with them. Um, mm -hmm. There are actually a number of questions I don't know if you've seen coming in on the platform uh, where Mike Savage was asking who owns journalists, and I speculated that journalists are actually owned by their editors. Um, <laughs> so um, put in another he's asking about the Twitter stream, yeah, Tom, and any, any publication who says that they're going to own a journalist Twitter stream is never going to attract good talent, ever. Hmm. So Do you agree with that, exactly. Thomas? What are the policies of different publications? Maybe we can hear from the FT and, and the journal. Yeah, I mean, yeah. a lot of our journalists, uh, well, in fact, all of our journalists, they own their own Twitter account, and they're responsible for everything that they tweet. We provide guidelines and, obviously, best practice tips, but our general rule of thumb is don't tweet anything that you wouldn't want to explain to the editor. And at the WSJ, I just want to say that, no, we don't, you know, if a journalist leaves the Wall Street Journal to go somewhere else, we don't take control of their Twitter account. We would never do that. It's seen as something that's very 
you know, it's part of them. It's part of their persona, um, and it's a very symbiotic relationship. But as more and more journalists, you know, become more sophisticated using social media, I think the talent you attract, uh, you're, you're more likely to find people with big followings no matter what. So it's not a zero-sum game. But Liz, if uh, if you don't own the journalist, but there are also certain standards which need to be kept up, and also um, fears of things like libel, how do you advise uh, journalists, given the fact um, that you don't own them, um, but or, or in other words, advise that they uh, uh, maintain a certain level of quality and integrity? I think that's actually a different question. Um, mm. You know, any journalist who comes to work for the Wall Street Journal we show them our ethical guidelines for being a journalist there. I think any professional journalist also understands that they give up certain things like being, unless they're a columnist, you know, if they're a beat reporter, they're, it's, it's always been frowned upon to share their strong opinion about something they cover in a public space. Um, and I think everybody understands that, that applies to social media as well. So we do a fair amount of counseling. We do training, um, digital training that includes social media where we talk about these issues and, my team is always available to answer questions and, and do gut checks with people, but we really haven't had any problems with that because I think it's sort of understood um, in terms of being a journalist that those, those values come to extend to social media. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there was a question that came in for, uh, for Tom Crampton. Um, are companies equipped to deal with uh, social network conversations as a workflow? Uh, there's nothing an organization streamlined. Uh, so, sorry, Steve streamed that way. Um, what do you think, Tom? Uh, I think a lot of organizations are very challenged with it because, I mean, uh, you know, if we're looking at this again from the perspective of media companies and, and, and companies, uh, I think the good news for media companies right now is that uh, a lot of organizations are, uh, are not that streamlined for it or do not have that workflow built in entirely. The bad news for media companies is that they're getting better and better at it over time uh, as they see the value uh, and, and build that into what they're doing. And I think that that's going to pose a, a, a challenge to media companies as they try to, as they, you know, differentiate themselves. Hmm, interesting. I mean, in a broad sense, uh, Tom, is the competition offered by uh, non-traditional news sources, big companies, individuals riding the wave of uh, democratization of news to be taken seriously? Um, obviously, probably the answer is yes, but I wonder sort of how seriously. And is um, there such a thing as traditional news anymore? Well, I, I think one interesting case study to look at is sort of an exercise in, in uh, 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 a thought exercise. What if you had somewhere where you shut down the traditional media uh, and had social media thriving? Uh, how would that, what impact would that have? And I think that that, that that thought experiment is happening right now in China, where there is no free traditional media. Uh, and as a result, people rely on social media to a tremendous extent. They have this very strong emotional bond to the internet, uh, much stronger than in any other place in the world. And I think that's, that's sort of a, a leading indicator of, of uh, the direction that things are going to go elsewhere. Um, in the United States or in Europe, you have this counterbalance where, you know, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the New York Times, they are all in effect competitors somewhat to the role that social media plays in China. Yeah, very interesting. Yolanda, I mean, can I turn to you on that? Um, First of all, do you see that as true? Um, do you see that, that, that what's happening in China and, and why social media has developed so much that way? And then also I wonder um, if social media is such a rival um, to the news or, um, in other words, is, is a corollary to the news, um, what kind of questions of accuracy and conflict of interest come from these rival entities? Thanks. Um, I don't think it's proper to say that it's a rival. I'd rather say it's better to collaborate and to consider this as a more positive and constructive way. And I totally agree with Tom, Tom Scrampton that China is a very interesting playground for social media. And, but in January, the crowdsourcing citizen journalism um, libraries in India to unpaid internships in, in the state, scandals in China to environmental destructions in Hong Kong. You see how citizen journalists can really help you instead of destroy you. So I think that's very interesting and, and something that newsrooms can learn from the ordinary citizens. And also on the back end, when you talk about accuracy and what the newsroom functions are, I think as Wall Street Journal, FT, Reuters, we're all globalized team of reporters and editors, and there are lots of investigations and more cracking we can still do. And that's still irreplaceable. And on the 
and also on the protections that the organizations can provide to the reporters, I think that's still an important function for organizations. Hmm. Do you, uh, Yolanda, do you really see that way, how they can help you uh, rather than, than destroy you, this, uh, this uh, other uh, element of, of social media? Um, how does it help you in your experience as a journalist? Help me as an individual? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, also, in, in, in as a reporter, as working from a newsroom, um, how does this, the social media competition help you? Well, there are lots of things you can learn. Like an interesting example is how the citizen reporters in China help the uh, finding out the luxury watches that the court officials are wearing, and they they actually like they went online and finding all the photos of the local officials and finding out the brand and the estimated price of the watches, and that actually lead to investigations of the uh, authority, and then some officials got sacked. So that's something a traditional newsroom might not really think of doing, and that it's impossible for single reporters to do. So I think there are so many interesting cases you can learn and to just try to work with the readers. Uh, interesting, Liz. Can can you comment on that? Um, uh, you know, essentially the information going both ways and how that basically helps the newsroom. Yeah, I absolutely agree with Yolanda. You know, to some extent, you can see social media as competition, um, but it's also a great place to diversify your sources and often where you're going to hear about news first. Although there's a fair amount of reporting that usually has to be done on top of that. Um, you know, a good example is something that happened in the U.S. recently. In the midst of the Boston bombing, there was another big story that broke about um, a fertilizer plant in Texas that exploded. And, you know, uh, we immediately went on places like Twitter and Reddit.com, um, where a lot of sort of eyewitness observations tend to get posted in these kind of situations. And immediately on Reddit, we found a very compelling video that was taken by a man um, who happened to be sitting there watching the, the fertilizer plant burn and then explode. So it was very, very compelling, um, but we couldn't use it right away. We wanted to find out what happened to this man, what happened, he, his child was with him, were they okay, you know, was this really of the explosion that happened in Texas or could it have been something else and people just posted it online. So, you know, it's a great place to find tips, and eventually we did verify this video was, in fact, of the incident we were trying to investigate, and that the man and his child were fine. Um, but, you know, it, it's a great place to, to find information like that. The same thing with the Boston bombing. There are thousands of people that were watching the marathon happen, and they all were eyewitnesses. They were all posting things to social media. Um, and that, that can be really helpful to a journalist who's trying to cover a story like that, but it takes a fair amount of sort of sophistication and understanding how to how to evaluate that kind of content before you put it into your news report. Yeah, interesting. Hey, Liz, you reminded me of something that you mentioned to me um, uh, earlier when we were talking uh, in pre preparation for this. There's, in, in some ways, the roles of, uh, of newsroom is changing. There's so much information out there that um, it becomes a question of evaluating actually the information that comes in. Um, could you comment on that a bit? Sure. Yeah, I think you know when I first started really paying attention to social media, it was during the Iranian re uh, Revolution of 2009. And at that point, it was sort of a novelty, I think, for journalists that, oh, people are sharing this information on social media. Um, and so it was a great alternative source. But now it's become so mainstream that I think, you know, not only journalists, but also our readers are sort of drowning in information. And the role of a news organization has changed a bit from finding information that in the past was scarce, we had to go out and get it for you, um, to helping you make sense of this flood of information that's out there on social media anytime a big story breaks. So, you know, in the case of the Boston bombing, we really saw ourselves as instead of adding value by live tweeting and, and you know, posting everything we saw out there, it was much more trying to help our readers navigate through all that information, what was going on, and really playing the role as the confirmation layer. So they knew they could come to us to find out what was really confirmed, what was really happening. Um, whereas all these other sources were just sort of putting everything that they found out there um, with very little verification and, and just 
you know, really operating in real time. I think I think um, our readers start to get a bit fatigued with that. So, so the role of the news organization is changing as social media changes as well. Oh, that's really interesting. Jay, um, is that uh, part of the role that the news organizations play now in this community outside of their walled gardens? Uh, the, everybody, every company is now a media company. Um, and they have to be. The, the idea of content marketing is, is gaining such momentum, which means, uh, as the example that Tom showed, I mean, there's just every company out there is trying to produce their own media, um, which means they're also trying to write their own stories. They're trying to be interesting. They're hiring journalists because Lord knows media organizations aren't hiring them out of journalism school anymore. Um, there, there's a massive amount of competition for those people who think of themselves as media companies from people who are non-media companies. And they, these, these people are producing stuff that they're trying to be interesting. They're trying to get in front of people. They're trying to get those same conversations going, building those same co communities, engaging the same, very same communities that, that media organizations are trying to sell ads to uh, or ad space to, in, to get in front of. Um, and, and so, yeah, so the, the news organization today has is, is got competition from everybody else. It's this trust thing that, that we, we still have uh, from traditional news uh, organizations that, that we, we're still leaning on. We're still sort of standing on and going, okay, well, we're the more trusted source of this. But then you see an account like HP, um, Associated Press, AP, a couple weeks ago got hacked uh, very briefly, and uh, a tweet went out saying that the, the White House had been bombed and that Obama had been injured, and $167 billion was momentarily wiped off of the stock exchange. Um, and that all got fixed pretty quickly. But all of these little tiny ticks that show up now, uh, overstressed news organizations that are trying to go too fast and are making more mistakes because they're understaffed and underpaid, uh, is eroding that trust factor. And increasingly, all these other brands out there who are producing interesting content, and that's all people want. Nobody wants the news to keep it to themselves. People want to share stuff. They want to get out and talk to each other and gossip. Oh, did you hear about this and hear about that? And less and less does it become, I need you know, to be talking about world events. Most people want to talk about something local, something more a more of a, a niche topic, things that they're they're you know more interested in sharing on Facebook with each other, and so all of these things are putting mass amounts of pressure on the media organization. Oh wow! Um, given that, um, well, actually, I mean, let me revert to a question that I, I really want to ask. I mean, that pressure is coming, that's for sure. Um, but can I mean, and you talk about the element of trust. I um, mean, the trust can be broken, like in the situations you described, but. Um, can you really rely on the accuracy of, say, um, say a Fortune 500 company could might, might be considered a rival in, in some circumstances to traditional uh, news media, at, le at least the way that they approach certain issues? But can you trust them not to have a conflict of interest um, as opposed to the traditional role of, of um, journalism, which is um, supposed to be independent? I don't know. I, okay. I, I watch Fox News. I, I wonder sometimes if I can trust them <laughs> to be independent. Uh, I mean, come on. Every, every media organization, especially, I mean, Becky, I mean, in the UK, it's even stronger. Every newspaper has a very clear agenda, a very clear place on the political, political spectrum. And, and so this idea that, that media outlets are somehow completely, you know, unbiased and objective is, 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 is kind of crazy. I mean, there, there are very few of those. There's far more who, who are, have a lean or a bent of some sort. Um, and, and so, yeah, do, do brands come with that same sort of thing? Oh, yeah, of course they do. So the thing is that people still like those bands. In fact, they, they love those things. They feel that's my community. That's my sort of people. I want to hear that sort of perspective. And I love those opinions because those are opinions I can share around the water cooler and make me sound cool. So it's okay to have those sorts of things. And, you know, trust, trust at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, it's this measure of, of do you give me the sort of information that I can, I can pass on and not look like a fool about and if I can keep doing that, then I, I trust you. If you burn me, well, okay, I'll, I'll forgive it once. But if, if you send me that second link and I click through it and it's Rick Astley again, that's it. I am never clicking on your links again. 
<laughs> Thank you for that. I, I, Liz and Yolanda, on, on the, the, the trust situation, I, I'm interested in this because, I mean, the Wall Street Journal traditionally, of course, has been a very conservative publication on its editorial page, um, but its reporting would be considered uh, independent, and and um, it devotes a tremendous amount of resource to the kind of reporting to actually get a story right and actually attack quite serious, serious and uh, interesting, difficult problems. Um, uh, what do you think, Liz? Um, do you think it's uh, everybody just has a point of view and it's uh, we're all just brands now? Uh, no, I don't really agree with that. But I do agree. You know, Jay pointed out some examples, um, international examples that are outside of the U.S. And I think there's different standards or, or just different approaches um, than you might find in the U.S. But but here, um, papers like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, as you say, where we try to make a separation between the news organization, the news operation rather, and the editorial page, and we are very independent. Um, and when it comes to social media, you know, again, that was something that really has cropped up um, in recent stories like the Boston bombing and the shooting in Connecticut that claimed the lives of so many children, that, you know, media made a lot of mistakes in those situations, and we sort of sacrificed some of or media as a whole kind of sacrificed some of its trust and credibility. Um, and, that, you know, I'm happy that the Wall Street Journal really made many, many fewer mistakes than other publications, but part of that um, maintaining our trust and our credibility and our integrity was not falling prey to that intense real-time pressure to get something out right away when our competitors were, were reporting it. So that's something that we're all, I think, media organizations are all struggling with right now is when you have a big story and people are reporting things, you know, whether it's on Reddit or CNN, there is a lot of pressure to match it and to figure out what's going on, um, especially and to get it out to your readers on Twitter. And in fact, at the, at the WSJ at least, we've tried to really slow down <laughs> in these cases, and I think it's served us well in terms of credibility. Oh, that's really interesting. I'd like to read a comment that came in. It says, uh, Ray, Boston bombings and the crowdsourcing. Let's not forget that Reddit rec recklessly, this guy says, uh, deepened the anguish of a missing student's family um, and social uh, – sorry, we just – having trouble toggling here. And um, social media can uh, drive the conversation, but old-fashioned um, checking uh, remains vital. Um, I, it sounds like uh, Wall Street Journal would agree with that. Um, Yolanda, could you I talk a little bit? I think there's a comment also that Justin Wood made, which is saying, to what degree uh, does social media make journalists lazy? They just sit in the newsroom monitoring news feeds and verifying <laughs> rather than digging and investigating. I think it's a really important point. That's what everybody's talked about, how you, know, you have to make sure that it's right. It's not just going to suddenly solve all the reporting problems that you have. Uh, and it's a danger if people think it does. Hmm. Yolanda, I just wanted to uh, get your reaction to that question um, that we were talking about earlier, and Liz was talking about earlier about um, uh, essentially uh, the accuracy and the, the idea of you might have to slow down to assess information. What's your take? Yeah, um, it's always important to do all the fact checking like you do in the old, old fashioned way. And also, we were talking about the trust issue. And I think it's better to look at this question from the reader's perspective. like people in their 20s, they spend way more time on social media than on traditional newspapers. So it's a time that we are changing from the old newsroom gatekeeping to a social gatekeeping. So it's important for the audience that the news reading has now become a very personalized and very individual experience. So it's important to think, think about your readers, how they really consume the news and what you can provide. So on accuracy side, it's, it's as newsroom, and you can really afford having fact checkers and having people, editors working on a story. But on the other hand, I think it's also vital for, for citizen reporters to, to really verify the information for you. There are some things it can be way more powerful than you can imagine. Do you uh, think uh, that social media makes journalists lazy? Um, uh, according to Justin Wood's question? Um, I don't think so. Um, actually, it, it takes more time to really vet information online, and it takes more time to really curate your sources to build the relationships online, because everyone, every individual source might have their own social media preference. 
You know, this one is LinkedIn, that one is Twitter, and you need to follow and you need to track and to build the trust online. It's just way more difficult. Thank you. Um, there's an interesting question that came in. Uh, w um, why, uh, with so many social networks in Asia, how do you monitor and find the most valuable information? It might be interesting to uh, ask uh, Jay and Tom about that. Uh, the, Tom, for example, yep. of information on social media, it's very tough in Asia. There's a lot of global platforms uh, that have existed for a while, something like Radiant 6, Visible Technologies, but when it comes to Asia, they don't pick up on a lot of what's going on for a number of reasons. One, they can't read Asian characters in many markets. Uh, and two, they don't look in the places where conversations take place. For example, in Hong Kong, uh, there's a lot of discussion groups that are very important where a lot of conversations take place and these global tools don't work. So often what you end up using is a uh, tool for a specific market. Uh, and what I'm talking about is sort of the, the, the in-depth listening that would be something quite expensive for a company to do and, get, and be very involved in. A simpler sort of listening that you can do just involves doing a search via Google or Baidu and setting up a news alert, which doesn't cost you anything. So there's, a, there's lots of different levels at which you can do it, uh, and it depends what you're trying to accomplish. But it can be quite complex and expensive to something much lighter that is, that is a simpler approach. I agree with Tom. It's, it, it, the, and this is, this is a problem that's actually going to start expanding, I think, beyond Asia as well. As we start seeing the bigger uh, homogenous uh, networks like Facebook um, sort of fracture into people wanting to belong to more and more niche groups, more and more local groups, more and more um, sort of private sort of groups, where there's a lot more value in, in a, a strong community of less than 100 people, and if you want to start having to, there won't be any tools that will allow you to sort of do that. And, and you almost have to really climb down into the trenches and you know, start becoming a member of these various communities. And, and yes, that, that's, a, that's a massive time-consuming task that, that can't, especially if you're a, a large organization trying to cover multiple regions, uh, that's not the job of one person. That's, that, that's going to require a whole new sort of thinking of how we go about doing these things. Interesting. I, can I turn to um, just a minute of investment in social media from media or media companies investing the right way to meet the competitive challenge that we've been talking about? Um, or do other type of entities such as big companies um, have an edge? Um, it, what do you think, Becky? I don't necessarily think that budget equals social media success. Having a strong recognized helps to grow a large audience, but that's a really wasted opportunity if they're not an engaged audience. We find some of our most positive feedback has come from really simple things like running live text chats on Google Plus just within the comment section. So we recently um, launched an ebook um, in China written by um, our correspondent um, out here, and he was on hand to answer questions in real time. And the positive feedback that we got was just amazing. The amount of people that interacted wasn't huge, but the quality of engagement was really, really high. And that's completely free. But social media isn't free, and that's often a misconception. We pay for tools, we pay for apps, ads, people, and time. You know, it's, it's really timely to build up an engaged audience. Hmm. Jay, um, just from your perspective as someone who consults with companies, uh, are social media companies, I'm oh, sorry, are media companies investing in the right way? Um, what do they need to do? Um, Oh, that's not. A, there's no short answer to that. Um, I wish there was. Uh, again, back to my my sort of original point that you know social is more about community than it is about media. And obviously, when you're running a media company, you're thinking a lot about you know producing the content and selling it. And as we've been looking at, there's a lot of these companies, other media, other regular businesses selling physical goods who are giving away media. And, and I think there, there's going to have to be a, a real remodeling of, of the business model, the business strategy, taking a bigger look at things like net a porte and thinking, wow, if they're producing a magazine and making money by selling clothes, um, you know, how do we in the media business compete against that sort of thing? What, what do we sell if we can't sell the media um, and we can't sell the ad space? And I, I think that, that this, is a, this is the sort of shift that 
we've been putting off a long, long time uh, in media, in, in traditional media organization, news organizations, and it's, it's, it's here. It's something that has to be faced. Tom, you have a take on that? Uh, I think that the thing, uh, uh, sort of echoing uh, uh, the point Rebecca was making, that, that uh, I, I think that money, yes, money is important, uh, sad to say, but it's not everything. And I think one important thing that has to take place is a shift in mindset uh, and approach. And that goes deeply throughout uh, a media organization or any organization for that matter in, in the way that it looks at social media. And it's not looked at as, you know, some a additional painful thing that I have to do in my job. No, it, it, it actually is your job. Uh, and, and people have to really adjust their, their expectations. And that doesn't cost more money. It, it, it's harder than getting money, actually. <laughs> it's a change in attitude. Harder than getting money. That's, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Liz, uh, it, it seems like a good time to uh, – so someone um, uh, asked uh, what's the next move or the next step for the Wall Street Journal and social media, but I wanted to combine it with a question which I had for you. Basically, you're drawing on your experience at the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Um, does social media have the power to build audiences for news organizations that they're otherwise losing or never had? And um, I guess maybe I can combine that where the Wall Street Journal going question is uh, with that one as well. What do you think? Sure. Yeah, that's absolutely a huge part of my team's mission is to find new audiences. Um, and actually, our social media audience at the Journal is the youngest one that we have. Um, it tends to be the most gender equal and also the most mobile. I think we're, it's between 40 and 50% of our social media referrals are coming from mobile devices. So this is sort of a, what we consider a bit of a new audience as well. Um, but yeah, I think you know both at the Journal and the Times, that was the case that um, you're reaching people in communities that may not think that they want to interact with the with the Journal on a regular basis, or that they have much to read there. Um, but we're sort of slowly changing their minds by by giving all that content a bit of a twist that's just for them. Um, and I, you know, I can answer both questions simultaneously by saying a lot of what we're doing that's new, what we're focusing on um, for the future in terms of the journal and social media is looking at, you know, what are people already using and how can we get them to talk to us there. Um, so one thing we've been spending a lot of time on are video chats, and we use a platform called Spreecast to do that. And we've really focused on getting young audiences there. So one of our most successful was we had our fashion reporter host um, some fashion bloggers, and they did a video chat that lasted about an hour. Um, readers could jump in, you know, kind of similar to what we're doing right now, and it was all about how to become a fashion blogger. And we had, you know, a bunch of teenagers emailing us afterwards saying, I never thought I would find anything on the journal that would be this fascinating, you know, um, I can't wait to read more. So we were sort of tapping into these communities that I think um, may not have ordinarily thought they could find anything um, on the journal. And, and we tend to frame things a little bit differently for them. For instance, on our Facebook page, it's much more visual. Um, we try to use humor when we can, um, you know, and, and try to pick news that is going to be really relevant to that age group and, and that community. So, so anyway, we're looking at um, younger readers. We're looking at new platforms like video, um, Rebel Mouse, Vine, where we're experimenting with getting people to send us things in vines. Um, right now, it's about to be the end of the college season, college graduate season in the U.S., so we're doing a lot with trying to engage people there and just did a project having um, notable people give advice to this year's crop of graduates on vine. So, um, sort of experimentation is the, is the word for us on the social media team. That's great, experimentation. Uh, is there a culture of experimentation at the Journal? Have you been part of changing that, or is there a willingness to do this kind of interesting thing like the fashion bloggers? There's definitely a culture of experimentation, actually, especially on the, on the digital staff. Um, so, and people in the, around the newsroom have been really excited about some of these projects. And, and we've got a lot of new allies and partners to work with, uh, the more we do. So it's great. Wow. Yolanda, um, different approaches for social media better suited to Hong Kong. Uh, you talk about that also in the context of the kinds of things that Liz was talking about. Liz talked about um, in what you know that going mobile for the readers. I think actually Hong Kong is very interesting on that end because Hong Kong has the, I think, highest mobile penetration in the world and second highest 
on smartphone penetration. So it's, there are a lot of potentials out there. And also, I think Hong Kong is very interesting because all the Western or international platforms like Facebook and YouTube are very popular here. On the other hand, the demographic is very, very diversified. And there are Hong Kong locals, Chinese Cantonese speaking, there are Mandarin speaking Chinese, there are Westerners, and there are all sorts of other minorities. And so it can be a very interesting playground to do all kinds of experiments. And one interesting example is how language can actually make a difference is last year there was a new content aggregator launched on Facebook. It's called House News. So it's a blog, it's a news provider, and it's founded by five Hong Kong locals. And within one year, they, they had more than 50,000 fans on Facebook page. So just in comparison, SMP, they had their Facebook page for more than two years, and, and now they have less than 20,000 followers. So that's a very interesting conflict and com competition there. Wow. Oh, it seems like a good time to ask a question that came in. We have about five minutes left, so I encourage anybody else who has questions to please ask them. But there was, um, uh, just a moment, uh, there was a, a question, what information, if any, can Google and it just... Uh, uh, what information, uh, if any, can Google, Facebook, uh, et cetera, pick up about a publication's audience through share buttons, other ways of sharing? How might it, uh, this develop in the future? Um, anyone want to take that? Jay, do you have any idea? Everything we click can be measured. Um, the question is here, what sort of secret stuff is Google doing? Um, uh, that's, I mean, that's sort of a little bit harder to answer. Facebook, though, of course, is tracking everything within their site um, of that, that people are sharing. Um, and in fact, most of that information, if you're using pages, I mean, Facebook Insights provides you, I mean, they, they feed that back to you. Um, Google, of course, provides Google Analytics, which you can install on your site and do all these things. I mean, these, these, these companies provide the very tools that we rely on so much for, for understanding. I'm just trying to parse this question, though. Is this a pri privacy question? Is, this, or is somebody worried here about, about um, big companies like Google and Facebook prying into our our community's sort of actions or something. I, I'm not exactly sure what it what it is. Um, I mean, I wouldn't. I'm not so worried about those sorts of of things in a in a case like this. Um, I'd be more worried from a public publication side is getting really good at understanding our analytics, really good at understanding um, when people share, why they share, what's being shared, measuring the share of things, how. Making all, doing all sorts of testing and, and adjusting to the user experience to try and get uh, do anything we can to improve the the conversation to improve the amount that people are exchanging and, and talking about stuff. Um, that's that's really uh, the important thing. And yes, these these companies do provide tools that make that possible. Yeah, I mean uh, that question was from Mike Savage. I um, I, I kind of parsed it the second way, although I did I did understand what you're saying that that w whether it might be considered a privacy question, but I think I mean, certainly agree with you on 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 the latter point. Um, there was a question actually d uh, directly to me, which I wasn't expecting about in these publications. Lloyd's list is in these publications. What application or what relevance does social media have to smaller public uh, publications? And I would say that. Um, uh, it has virtually the same. Um, uh, you can uh, build a community. You can get um, information from readers uh, and from the audience in new ways. You can find out things going on far and beyond, well out there over the ocean that you would never find out before, and you can respond and build an audience. Uh, so it's become quite a useful tool. That said, uh, smaller companies, uh, uh, media companies or smaller publications don't tend to have the ability to invest in the way something like the Wall Street Journal would. Um, that's a disadvantage in some ways um, because it, it, less attention is paid to it. On the other hand, because there are so many avenues to express and build community, it actually gives us uh, an edge that we never had before. Um, all right. Um, last question for everybody or anybody who wants to take it. Um, will social media help destroy or help revive the public's consumption of accurate, independent, high-quality news? Um, Liz? <laughs> That one. I don't think it's going to destroy it at all. Um, I think you know the social media ecosystem and the news ecosystem is changing in tandem. It's very symbiotic, and I think that the you know readers are getting much more sophisticated about where they're getting their information, and news can help play a role in in helping them confirm and and even learn how to evaluate some of these sources on their own. 
um, just a quick anecdote, one thing I did during Hurricane Sandy in New York was write a blog post about how to identify fake photos because so many of them were being shared across social networks by regular people who may also be Wall Street Journal readers. And that was one of our most popular posts. Um, so I think, you know, readers, as they get more sophisticated, as they're, as they're exposed to more forms of information, they're still also looking to these organizations for some guidance and, and some confirmation. Wow, thank you. Um, and Becky, I'd like to ask you the same question. Uh, will social media help destroy or help revive the public's consumption of accurate, independent, high-quality news? I think it depends where you get your news from. If the FT is known for its accurate and reliable journalism that informs readers with the knowledge that they need to be able to do their jobs. It's content that they can rely upon and a journalist take on not just the what but why it matters. And this level of accurate commentary and analysis can't just be obtained anywhere. Thank you. And Thomas, um, as you started us off, off rather nicely. Could you uh, address that, actually, since you've seen um, the situation from both sides of the fence, as it were? So uh, I think, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, I was just focusing a lot on the question that just came over, which I thought was a really interesting one. If I can oh, okay. uh, move to that, which is Lau asked a really interesting question about, I'm an independent reporter. Considering distributing my articles on social media, would you please advise how I can gain an audience? She's posting her articles on Facebook, but the audience base is limited. My advice to that or any journalist who's looking to grow their audience in social media is look to where your audience is based uh, and understand where they are. And, and what I've found is that some journalists have actually got tremendous systems, almost like you know, using MailChimp to send out articles to people when they're writing on a topic that's of interest to a certain category of person. And I think the value of that, as we've heard from the Wall Street Journal and, and uh, uh, Reuters and, and the Financial Times is that you're developing this relationship with your audience, and particularly if you're like Lily, who's focusing on a narrow topic, on SME news, uh, you can really have a tremendous relationship that when that article goes out, people can maybe agree or disagree with your article or suggest new angles that you can take on an issue uh, and, and, and discuss something. And I think that uh, sort of wrapping out now, I've mentioned all the publications, I'll mention Jay, you know, as Jay was talking about with community, it, it, it's you're building up a community around uh, uh, all of those, uh, uh, that, that topic, and really that's the way that you can use social media not just as a distribution channel, which is one level, but really as a way to improve on the quality and quantity of what you can report. Oh, if thank if you I could much. just add one piece of that to advice for Lily, um, don't, put, don't put all your eggs inside Facebook. It, it's a walled garden and they own everything inside of it. Um, it, it, do like Tom's saying. Try and get try and get people, uh, your contacts, your audience, your community outside of Facebook. Get their emails. Get them onto a news list. Make sure that you own your community base, um, not somebody else. Well, thank you. With that, uh, uh, with that message, I think we have to close off now. Uh, we had about an hour of very, very, very fascinating discussion. I'd like to uh, thank Liz and Yolanda and Becky, Jay, and uh, last but not least. Uh, Thomas, uh, for any questions, comments, or feedback, please email us at mail uh, at soapasia.com. And once again, thank you to those panelists, and uh, thank you to SOPA. Everyone else, have a really good day, and um, thank you, Liz, for joining us from New York. Goodbye.